Any of you people that think that I'm that I can elevate you and give you a great inspirational shot in the arm, or if you've come here for some kind of magic or to hear someone communicate the ineffable, the absolute truth, then I'll just please forget it. Because uh, never, never can I do that. I had started to talk off, I think, to some of you people. Uh, some of you, I recognize some of the faces here. Uh, a week or two ago, at which time I announced that uh, the reason I know I was no miracle worker was because that afternoon I had tried to go for a walk down in Monterey Bay and I sank like a rock. Uh, the point is very simple here. The, uh, the, the listening, the life that is listening, the awareness that is listening is where the miracle is. And it is not with the image that you see. And this is so. So you're not looking at anybody that has any power or capacity to do anything to you or for you, to help you in any way. But the very identity you are, that which is doing the listening and perceiving, is all there is to all the power in the universe. The infinite power itself is that which is listening and right now and looking and perceiving and sees images within it. Let me tell you, I was uh, watching your fire get on your way in the other room in there. Now, in Alabama, we don't have all the fancy things you people have got here in California. But we got one thing. We got wood that burns. <laughs> What's wrong with these logs, for crying out loud? They've been going for... Jeanette told me, she says, Mother, you should have some, some kindling wood on there, not just those logs. They'll never burn. Oh, I've been watching <laughs> this one in there. Kindling when you and it, it's got a grand blowtorch going underneath it, and it's been going for 30 minutes, and the wood it hasn't even started doing anything. You've got asbestos trees out here or something. Evidently... <laughs> Oh, there's a familiar face. Well, there's Merle. There he is. Now, here, Lucky. You want to come over here? Yeah. Here, Lucky. Here, Lucky. Here, Lucky. If you don't hurry up and sit down and shut up, you're going to miss all these pearls of wisdom. <laughs> uh, no, I was just, the wood out here is very, this is truly a beautiful state. And I want to tell, I, whenever I go out, I don't come out like this very often. I really don't, because I have found it wise, I think, not to. Uh, I stay, I am secluded in, in the, what must be the back woods of the universe down in Alabama. And, uh, and then where I am in Alabama, that's the back woods of Alabama where I have lollygod. And uh, I don't come out to speak like this on, on, on very many occasions. But I want all of you to know that I appreciate being here. And uh, I'll tell you all now how lovely I think Carmel is and what a beautiful place it is. Monterey also. In Monterey. Oh, yes. I mean, this whole area. <laughs> this whole, well, for that matter, the whole darn state is most amazing. I have been a few places in, in my travels. And uh, I've never found such a happy combination as I found here. And this is why. In all honesty, why I came back to conclude the book here. I thought that those, the, the little touches of grace that, that, that maybe you folks that have written books know that uh, there are the finishing touches, the things that make it and give it its significance or its upturn or its tenderness or whatever you want to call it. That to me is the, the salt and pepper of a book and uh, it's the most difficult part of a book. It seemed to me that this area would be by far the most conducive, and it has been. This is a rare, I don't mean to sing your praises highly, the whole universe is beautiful. The whole world is beautiful. There's beauty everywhere to be perceived, not in the middle of the desert. But those of you who have studied Oriental mysticism or Oriental philosophy know that, that uh, the Orientalist is cautioned not to become enthralled with beauty. Not to become bewitched with, by beauty or with beauty. And I think that the uh, one area on this earth where that bewitchment is the most likely, has to be out here, 
along your Big Sur. These beautiful trees you have, flowers that bloom and are not supposed to bloom. What kind of flowers do you folks have anyway? Nasturtiums are supposed to bloom just in the spring. Okay. Just in the spring. That's a spring bloomer everywhere in the United States except California. They bloom in the spring and that ends them. Here they bloom all year long, don't they? The darndest thing I ever saw. And honeysuckle. Now, I thought I was a honeysuckle expert because, you know, down south in old Alabama, that's where the honeysuckle land. Well, I thought I knew all about honeysuckle, and it blooms in the spring. Very fragrant, you know, and it's a beautiful thing. But here, your honeysuckle blooms. It's blooming like that. Most amazing. I'd like to have somebody tell me why that happens. I, I don't know. Well, these comments by way of just all of us establishing some kind of relaxation here and rapport. I have told you that I don't really have anything that's new to say. Uh, I believe that any of you who are students of philosophy will see that all that I have to say has been said many times before. Maybe I'm putting it in terms that will be simple or easier to comprehend or understand. But there has been historically throughout all the philosophies of the world a little seed, a little thread that one can follow that is a very simple statement. It seems to be the heart and soul of the religious ideas when they first presented themselves. And that is a very simple statement, or predicate if you want to call it that, that God is all. That God, or reality, or truth, or isness, or whatever name, is all. Is all. And truly, it's a very simple idea. It isn't difficult to understand. But it is profound beyond belief. Now, metaphysics, as metaphysics is honestly stated, has as its primary basis the fact that isness or God or mind or any of whatever these synonyms are is all. Is all. And A double L means all, outside of which there is nothing else, besides which there is nothing. Single, alone, total, and all. Now, somehow or other, the way it has been presented, or the way it has been understood and interpreted, or the way it is normal for us to understand it and perceive it, we've taken this very simple idea and turned it around and made something very complex and abstruse and difficult to comprehend. About it. Now, if I have any purpose whatever, and if it appears that my work is doing anything at all, it is that it is making these ideas very simple, such uh, at least simple enough such that they can be comprehended and tried. And you bear in mind that the mark of any philosophy is to try it. Now, in this country, in the United States, we've got a lot of people who are, are philosophers. As a matter of fact, everybody's a philosopher. Everybody has an idea about what life is and what death is and what identity is and what truth is. But what is lived is quite another thing. Now, in other parts of the country, people have a real philosophic concept of life and live it. I mean, they get out and live it. And of course, as you know, in recent years, a new philosophy has rather come on uh, existentialism, which is for the one of the philosophies in this era that has really, that is in the recent time, that has really been tried out. That is, people actually living it. Which, uh, I'm not now saying anything good or bad or right or wrong, I'm just pointing out that it is a philosophic concept that stirs people up enough that they decide, okay, I'm going to try it out and I'll live it. And for this country, that's new and unique. It has only been done once in this country that I know of, and that was with the birth of metaphysics. That is, Western metaphysics, as it was presented back in the middle part of last century when a lady came out and stated some philosophic principles, put it in new terms, simpler terms, clothed with, uh, with uh, a terminology of love uh, such that all of a sudden, without mincing words, she just said, well, God is love. God is all, and it does great things in your experience if you'll try it out, and in effect, a lot of people did, because there was many reasons to do it. It was a puritanical era, and 
there were an awful lot of restraints and restrictions being imposed by various religious ideas. And in any event, it was a philosophic concept put to work. And as you know now, the metaphysical movements, wherever they are, are the only philosophies that are really being lived in this country. Well, okay. Back to the idea of simplicity. Let me tell you, you've all heard this probably, but I'll say it again. There's a story that one time God uh, said, well, we have this idea, this truth, it's such a simple thing, and we don't want it profaned and kicked around and distorted and disturbed and so forth, so where shall we hide it so that it won't be goofed up? And, uh, of course, I'm paraphrasing liberally, you people that have read the story. Uh, and someone suggested that he hide it in the ocean be because it was very deep and very big and it would be pretty hard to find it. And, and uh, God said, no, sooner or later it'll be found there. And another angel suggested, well, let's hide it in the cloud somewhere or somewhere on the moon or something. And he said, nope, it'll be found there one of these days too. And uh, so he said, the, only, the best place to hide simplicity, let's bury it deep within the intellect of mankind because the intellect will never, never allow it to be found. Uh, and so... Now, what I have to say to you folks tonight, I can tell you, young people or anybody else, that your intellect will never buy these ideas. The intellect, that which you are educating when you go to school. The intellect, that which allows you to move back and forth within a tangible arena and, and come and go in the business world or run your home or business or anything else. That aspect of Comprehension will never understand this idea of simplicity, the allness of God. Only the heart understands it. The heart does. Now, by the heart, I really don't know what, how to, how else to say it, except that inherent and deep within us is a basic and underlying reality that we really are, and it's the heart, or love, or identity, whatever term you want to use, the real, that does comprehend an idea and understand it. And the heart will understand these ideas tonight. The intellect won't. The intellect will argue with it. The intellect will get disturbed and upset and probably keep a lot of you from sleeping well tonight. But don't be disturbed about it. And if you feel yourself filled with anger, animosity, or would like to wring my neck, don't worry because many <laughs> it's happened many times. Uh, but the intellect is that aspect of our nature that seems to be the grand judge in the universe. It's also that aspect of us that has its trials and tribulations, that suffers, that grows old, that is sick, that is a few days and full of trouble. And, uh, well, okay, I've just said a mouthful. I suppose somebody would say, well, now let's explain that just a little bit. But first, let's come back to the basic predicate of this simple concept. All the metaphysical philosophies, east, west, north, south, mid-eastern, Southwestern, Martian, have begun with one predicate, and that is simply that God is all, or reality is all. Well, how can how how can this be so? Well, all I can do now is I will make an effort to say some things that will be intellectually acceptable, because the intellect stands as some sort of a big judge in our mind's eye, and it listens to things, and it either turns it down and argues with it vehemently. Or it will say, aha, it makes some intellectual sense, so I will accept it and I will salt that away and see how this compares with my other ideas. So it is necessary in order to say the truth as the truth is, I, it seems as we talk like this, that it's necessary to get something past the intellect. So I'll have to make statements that will be intellectually acceptable. I just might say that when folks come to Mountain Brook, the first part of our our get-together is just this, just what we're doing now, but very seldom is there a real bang-up comprehension of what's going on until, until some rapport has been established, until, until egos are subdued, passions are put away, and people relax, and this usually takes place the second and third day. This is why I might tell you people would, that have in mind listening to tapes, one listening to a tape is virtually like nothing. 
There's an old saying somewhere that nothing has been listened to once until it's been heard 12 times. Or nothing has been read once until it's been read 12 times. And uh, I can say that, that you don't hear it the first time. When you get a letter, you don't really know what it says the first time. You have to read it half a dozen times. So uh, I would suggest that you people not hesitate to play certain things that you have felt have some significance and, and listen several times. But always with the understanding that it isn't the tape that's doing the instructing, it's the awareness that's listening that is growing and expanding and developing a pace. Who and what you are is where the wisdom is, the light is. It sure isn't with a man by the name of Samuel or any other name, a man by the name of Jesus. It isn't there. It isn't with a, with a, a book called a Bible. It isn't there. It isn't with an institution called a university or church or anything else. Truth resides here as I. And when I say I, I mean identity, and you can put yourself. Every time I use the word I, tonight put yourself there, because that's where the truth is, and nowhere else. And to this extent, all the humanists in the group here want to applaud, because this is what the philosophy of humanism says. In effect, this is also what the philosophy of, of uh, existentialism says, but this is also what about 20 other philosophies say. So let's go on with it a little. How do we know that God is all? Well, we all need to make this determination for ourselves. I can sit up here and talk. But this is one point that, that what appears or comes to you as an instructor, this can be said a million times. Sooner or later, one must buy this precept for himself. How does one know that God really is all? And until this is bought, why well, then I, you're wasting your time with any kind of a metaphysical concept, or is this, if you want to use that word, a reality, it doesn't have to be God in, in a theological sense, because we're darn sure not talking about a God that some, sits somewhere on a throne with a big beard and waves a wand and is waiting for the last day of judgment and has Jesus Christ sitting on his right hand and something else on his left. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something entirely other than that, and I don't mean to be ridiculing those ideas either, because those ideas all serve their purpose. And I'm not in any way, form or fashion, knocking any kind of a religious concept because I'm not opposed or contrary to anything that I include within myself, unless I want to be self-destructive. But let's come here and see what we mean by God is all. Now, I can just point out what has been significant in my own comprehension in this regard. And you can do with it uh, as you see fit, but... I might say to you young people that some years ago a, a society in this country that is given to atheism and has a grand publication about the fact that God as God is advocated is unreal, that there is no such thing as God. Anyway, it's an atheistic outfit. Well, at this time I was right on the north-south route as the people came down from the east going down to Florida, the young people who travel a lot. They're still traveling, you know. And uh, uh, that traveling serves a purpose, too. But, uh, and so all, a lot of the atheists began to go out of their way and come over from Birmingham into Mountain Brook, which was just a few miles away, to, to argue with me because I had published some little something that had to do with the allness of God. And so these people wanted to come down and point out how wrong I was and the fact that there wasn't any God to be all. And... Uh, I can say that as these people came through that I do not know of a single instance where by the time if it was over that there was not a complete agreement. Because most of our arguments about modern day religion and organized churchdom or as it is presented in, a, in our society is our argument lies with the superstitious presentations that are made. Our argument lies with the dogmas and the uh, dictatorial uh, concepts that appear to be so contrary to common sense, contrary to uh, the modern or expanded view. 
And this is what the argument is, not whether there is God or isn't God. Uh, so as I present this, these remarks relative to why God is all, this is in effect part of the presentation I made to these young people that seem to be heard and listened to, and many have gone on to study these ideas, and carry them around and find new experiences as a consequence. But, uh, okay, now, how do we know that God is all? Who, who, does anybody, would anybody like to say why or how we know that God is all? How do we know that there is one God? Judaism began with such a principle. You know, thou shalt have no other God before me. Christianity has begun with the concept of one God. All the philosophies, generally, the religious concepts include this idea. But how do we know this one God? What is this idea? What do we mean by oneness, singleness? Grand religion on this earth called unity speaks of oneness continually. How do we know there is a oneness? Well, th these are at least some of the ways by which I did intellectually get past the intellect and finally get to the heart with it. Just consider, for example... Everything tends towards oneness. Everything that we perceive in this universe tends towards oneness. You start out and you've got, you've got electrons and protons and other particles whirling around a single nucleus and, and uh, it, it is one atom, isn't it? And then we've got a whole passel of atoms that winds up being one molecule. You've got a bunch of molecules that will, or something winding up being one grain of sand or something. And you've got lots of grains of sand that, that tend to be one rock. And you'll see that many rocks tend to be one mountain. In all nature, everywhere we look, we see everything tending towards singleness. You will find that many mountains tend to be one continent. And you will find that several continents tend to be one Earth. It's always a move towards singleness. You'll find that, that several Earths or planets constitute one solar system. You'll find that one or a lot of solar systems constitute one galaxy. A lot of galaxies constitute one universe. All right. That which is being the one final universe is that which is God. That which is being, the totality of being, is what God is. Now that totality of being certainly includes life, doesn't it? Because there's life right here, right now, living, being aware. It includes trees and bees and little girls with 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 scrubby knees that show under many skirts or something nowadays, right? And it show a little boys, it, it includes mountains, it includes birds, it, it includes all of the images of perception, all included in and within the universe, all tending towards a single oneness. Well, that which is being life, which is being things, is what we call God. But now let me show you why it is ineffable. That is why there is no way in the world to, to put your finger on what God is, why it is an undefinable term, why you can't outline it or describe it or use words to speak of what isness is or reality is. It's impossible. All of the religions have said, ah, you can define everything, but you cannot define what God is. And we all know that, the, in fact, in, in Hebrew history, there was a time when the word wasn't even written, the word representing God. In fact, this is still true. And some other concepts in, in, in both the East and the Mideast where the word God won't even be written, just a dash meaning Jehovah or Isness or Yud. So, why then would it be ineffable? Let, let me use a little illustration. Let's take a tennis ball, for example. No, I won't. Let me use one that all of you, some of you are familiar with. Let's pretend that there's a lump of gold in the middle of the room. Gold. A lump of gold. 
Uh, better yet, let me do this. Let, let me tell you all of what these things are that we see, the birds, trees, mountains, and so forth. I'll tell you that they, these are what we call the qualities and attributes of God. All of you people that have studied physics or chemistry know what we mean by qualities and attributes. Well, isness is apparently being those qualities and attributes that constitute the universe where we can simply certainly comprehend this. Something has to be whatever these things are. And whether that something is random or ordained or living or dead is another matter, but at the moment, let's forget that and just say that there is some isness being the qualities and attributes that constitute the universe, including this life right now that is living here. All right? Now, why it is not possible ever to see or perceive God I can point out with an illustration that we call the lump of gold. If you will just see in the middle of the room a lump of gold and pretend that it's all and only and that there isn't anything else besides. Well, what are the qualities and characteristics or attributes of the lump of gold? Well, one of them is that it's yellow. Right? It's yellow. So yellow then is a... And yellow is not all there is to gold, is it? So therefore, yellow is, in this sense... Let's pretend, by the way, that this lump of gold also is infinite. That is, without, without beginning or end. It's eternal. It's eternal, not infinite, eternal, without beginning or end. Okay, now, if you take the, uh, the one of its qualities and characteristics is yellow. Well, yellow by itself is nothing. Now, yellow couldn't exist unless the lump of gold did. And yet there isn't any gold itself, isness, in what you call yellow. Yellow is just a quality or a characteristic. The quality is because gold is. Isn't this so? Now, another one is that it is malleable. Well, okay. Is there any gold in what we call malleable? There is not. But malleable exists. Malleable is measurable. Malleable is thereby, therefore, since it's measurable, it's finite. Malleable is not all there is to gold, is it? it uh, but yet malleable lives and moves and has its being because gold is. And another, gold is, uh, well, you might say, heavy. Is there any gold in the term heavy? You might also say that it's... Uh, Whatever it would, its taste would be. I don't know what the taste of gold is. Is it tasteless? Well, you'd say tasteless. But is there any gold in tasteless? And you'll see that the only thing that we ever perceive with the eye, or measure, or hear, or touch with a hand, or are any way consciously aware of, are these qualities and attributes. And yet there is no gold itself. That is, isness itself in the qualities and attributes. These qualities and attributes live and move and have their being because gold is, because the lump of gold is. So, even if we knew all there was to know about the qualities and attributes, and knew everything about their relationships and interrelationships, we would still not perceive that isness which is being those qualities and attributes. So it is that if we were to know everything there is to know about all of the chemical things that we perceive in this universe, and all of the physical things, and or material things, and all of the stars and the planets, and all that constitutes them, and all of their relationships and interrelationships, backwards and forward. And the intellect would perceive all there was to perceive them. The intellect would still not have touched that isness which is being those qualities and attributes. So it is that we can see intellectually why we can't define this term isness or God. But we can understand that something is being the qualities and characteristics. Would you have yellow if there were not a real, if there were not the, the, the isness called gold? Would you have malleable or soft or, or whatever, or ductile or whatever the other qualities and characteristics? Something has to be them. So therefore, there is an isness, an ineffable, unnameable isness, being what we perceive to be the universe and this consciousness of it. And that isness for lack of a better word, it's called God. And where is it? Where is God? Where is reality? Where is this isness? This is an ineffable isness. Why? It's right here. Being this consciousness that is conscious of the things. 
You know, I went around the world looking for God. Twice. Not once, twice. Traveled on and studied in several continents with all kinds of teachers, only to find out that, that God was closer than fingers and toes, closer than breathing, that God a reality is being this very life I am. That this consciousness has no lives and moves and has its being because isness is, reality is, and ineffable is. But let me tell you, if this ineffable can be such a perfect universe, can have planets wheeling with inexorable precision, balance beyond belief, all the physicists and chemists are constantly being amazed at the intricate, perfect, harmonious, mathematical precision at every turn of the road, and at every study. If isness can be that perfection, then what need does this awareness being I have to worry about its existence, its being? None at all, none at all. Here's another method. Oh, everybody's listening intently. I appreciate that. But don't forget, the wisdom is what's listening. Wisdom is who and what you are. The awareness it's, it includes the, the sounds is where, where wisdom is. But let's take another thing. Let's just work it the other way around, the way it appears in humanly. We are forever botched up. Let's say that instead of having chairs and trees and uh, and people and businesses and mountains and a human society that instead of those things that everything was just numerals, numerals, numbers. And big numbers, little numbers of all descriptions and an infinity of them. And instead of having grains of sand and blades of grass, you've got numbers or some other sign or symbol of arithmetic. Now let's just say now and furthermore, that we have been identifying ourselves as one number. You know, you know, I, you'd say daddy is number one and mama is number two and I'm number three because I follow and, and so and so else is number four. Or you can say the boss is number one and man, I'm number 12 down at the <laughs> other end. Or, you know, Okay, now this is what visualizes this universe of nothing but numerals, and so you've been going around and you've been having all kinds of trials and tribulations, and one number is taking advantage of another. You don't have enough. You don't have enough number sevens to buy the, the uh, number 22s to eat for dinner, this number 19, you see. <laughs> and uh, you, uh, or number 12 has just, told you off, and so you would like to poke him in the number 62, or kick him in the 409. <laughs> okay, so, so here, everywhere you go, you have this grand jumble of numbers, and it appears that it's dog eat dog, number eat number. <laughs> okay, so one day, one day, you climb a beautiful high number, number seven. And you go and you sit down on the edge of this number seven and you look down below on this beautiful, beautiful valley of 22s and 19s and 16s and there goes a meandering 89 and over there is a towering another number seven. But while you're sitting there, and by the way, you maybe call yourself number three. And while you're sitting there and you're looking down at this vast jumble of numbers everywhere, Maybe a great big bolt of 444 comes and clobbers you <laughs> in the 22 again. And so after this, this terrible experience, you then look out on this scene, and lo and behold, for one reason or another, you do perceive that 2 plus 2 equals 4. You see some 2s down there, and you see some 2s over there, and you can see that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And you can see that, uh, that, that one 
is a begins a sequence of numbers and the two follows one and three follows two and then you discover sequence while you're up there or some other principle of arithmetic, the principle of arithmetic. Well, now, you let me tell you what happens. With this discovery, you, dis you discover, perceive, suddenly, that instead of a vast jumble of people, places, and things, dog-eat-dog, -dog, societies, one trying to get the better of another one, some crying for black studies or white studies, some saying I'm being discriminating, and some saying you don't love me enough, or something else, you suddenly perceive that behind that there is a beautiful, harmonious, and eternal and perfect principle. Principle. And the principle is perfect. The principle has no argument going on within it. The principle has no mistake or error going on within it. The principle had no beginning and no end. Stop and think about it. When did the principle of arithmetic begin? Hasn't there always been a principle? I mean, does there really have to be two rocks and two rocks to make four rocks before there is a principle that says a principle of, of addition or a principle of subtraction or a principle of division? A principle is without beginning, without end. It is not material either. What's material about the principle? What's finite about it? Where can you go that the principle isn't? Pythagoras presented these ideas. He said, if you want to know what God is, study the principle of arithmetic. He says, many of the qualities and attributes that are, that are present in the principle that we call science or mathematics is, are true because God, and are the proof of God. Well, consider again the uh, principle of arithmetic. And it's, you've always heard that God is everywhere. Well, where can you go that you, can't, that you aren't where the principle is, the principle of arithmetic? If you were to climb up here on this house, this roof, this very lovely home, well, the principle of arithmetic is up there. Now, whether you are applying it or making use of it, that's quite another matter. But the principle is there. Perfectly. And how much of the principle is there? Every cotton pick and bit of it. And it's been there eternally. And what can happen to it? Nothing. You can drop a hydrogen weapons and destroy what appears to be this earth. And the principle goes right on being the principle itself. It's indestructible. Now, suppose there's a problem present relative to this thing of the principle of arithmetic, and, and there appears to be a big error that's been worked, and you've got some kind of a something going that says 2 plus 2 is 12, and it appears as a, as a bump or, a, or, a, or a, a bump on an organ or something, or a faulty heart, or a, it appears to be the absence of, of love or companionship, or it appears to be... Uh, not enough dollars. <laughs> okay. So here we ponder then what appears to be a problem and what, what a grand comfort it is to perceive that the entire principle is present right where the problem appears. That means then that the solution, the answer, is right where the problem appears. It's here and nowhere else. We don't have to go anywhere to perceive it. The principle is right here. The comfort that everyone is looking for, the tranquility about which I write, the peace that I would make some effort to communicate or talk about, is right here. It's here. Okay. Consider another aspect of uh, the principle of arithmetic. The principle shows itself forth by means of its signs and symbols, doesn't it? That is, the principle demonstrates what it is by means of its signs and symbols. The principle, therefore, includes all of the signs and symbols necessary to show it forth. For example, the principle of arithmetic is as many number sevens as anybody could ever want or could ever use, and there, you'd never run out of them. Furthermore, the principle is effortlessly being that which shows itself forth. Now, take these signs and symbols. They, where do they exist? They exist in and as the principle. The signs and symbols themselves are unimportant. That is, they have no value of their own. The value, inevitably, is the principle. 
The numbers are just numbers. The value is in that isness which is demonstrating itself by means of numbers. So when we perceive this point now, all of a sudden, what can number three do to number two, or what can number two do to number three? Well, in truth, nothing. Nothing. I think at this point, since I feel that there, everybody has gone so deeply with me, let's not make too much of a good thing. Let's take a break at this time, and if you want to have a cup of coffee, or go to the something, or kick these ideas around, let's knock it off right now for a few minutes. Okay? Okay.